When you were a child, how many times did you beg your parents, oh, please, please, give me another list of rules and regulations for me to live by? You had lists, didn't you? I didn't think anybody asked for more. But how often did you try to put off bedtime by begging, please, just one more story? Nobody did? Oh, yeah. Oh, a few of you. I did, too. Yes. And it helped having a bedroom in the basement while my parents were upstairs. And they thought they tucked me into bed. But what do we do at family reunions? We trot out some of the famous and not so famous old family stories, initiating each new generation of the family as it grows and extends even broader and larger. We initiate them into the stories of our ancestors. And in the telling and the retelling, we make our family story a living history to each one, not just a bunch of dead facts. Stories are how we learn who we are, where we've come from, and part of the direction as to where we're going. A mature human being lives what we could call a well-storied life. There are lots of stories about us that we celebrate our one anniversary as a, as a country this year. 150th. There's lots of stories of Canada that help to give us our identity as Canadians. It changed. The Cour de Bois. Who? <laughs> and I'm not going to say you remember the Cour de Bois because they lived a long time ago. <coughs> but you remember learning about the Cour de Bois. What about the Royal Northwest Mounted Police? when they first came into being in the early days of Canada. And some of my favorite stories that I heard growing up were Great Depression stories that my mother loved to tell. How they didn't have this, they didn't have that, and they had to brush their teeth with their fingers, and they had baking soda only if they were lucky. And their teeth were checked. And all sorts of stories from that era of our lives as Canadians. And then, stories that I begged my father to tell me, but he never did. I had to learn about it in history classes and read about it in books. Stories of Canada becoming recognized as a global nation through our involvement in two world wars. My father never said a word of stories from World War II. How many of you remember what happened and defined a little bit of Canadian life from Ontario to the East Coast in 1954, in the fall of 1954. What happened? Hurricane Hazel. There it is, Hurricane Hazel. Right on. Stories in our local area right here. When the city changed its name from Berlin and named itself after Lord Kitchener during the First World War. Stories of residential schools, government-sponsored and the church-sponsored and run throughout Canada for several generations. Do you remember the identity that we had as Canadians, very proud Canadians in 1972 in the Canadian-Soviet Summit Hockey Challenge, the gold medal game, where the winning goal was scored with 34 seconds left by whom? Wow. You're good. Paul Henderson. And stories of pride of our great Olympic athletes like Clara Hughes, Haley Wickenhauser, Victor Davis, Nancy Green. Do you remember Nancy Green? Sure. And many, many others. There are stories that teach us about our family identity. We know some of the very proud moment stories in our family's ancestry back. And we probably know a little bit and don't want to talk too much about the stories that nobody wants to talk about. The not so proud stories of our family identity. The scandalous secret stories. There are triumph and tragedy stories in every family background. 
There are love stories. I loved listening to my parents for a while. There was a certain age bracket when I was younger that I loved listening to how my parents met and fell in love with each other, and, and then, you know, the rest is history, as they say. But there's those stories that warm our hearts and make us, when we're young, hope. And then there's the stories of old grudges that we never seem to get over as human beings. There are so many stories of our identity as family people. But we are not just human beings, are we? We are God's beloved children. We are known as Christians. And Christians are more than just our country's story. And Christians are more than just our family background stories. We have the greatest story ever told. We have the story of Adam and Eve, of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. We have the story of Jesus, the Savior of the world. Our most basic identity as Christians is that we are to tell the story of Jesus. We are to live out the story of Jesus to everybody that we meet in our daily lives. But do you know the story of your living faith? And do you know it enough? Are you comfortable in your skin as a child of God to be able to live and share your story of Jesus with people? One of the sad truths of us North American Christians is that we are woefully understory when it comes to the stories of faith. A few years ago, the Pew Study of Religious Knowledge found that North Americans' knowledge of the Bible, of world religions, and of how to live out a life of faith in our everyday society is embarrassingly low. This is for Christians. How low? Well, atheists and agnostics scored higher than evangelical Christians, and Roman Catholic Christians, because they categorize the groups of Christians. The Bible Belt Southerners in the United States got the worst scores, believe it or not. And it was really interesting to read that there's quite a few Christians in North America that think Deuteronomy is a rock band. <laughs> what book of the Bible is it? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. It's the fifth, the last of the Pentateuch, Deuteronomy. There may be a band named Deuteronomy, I don't know. And do you know how many people actually wonder if Joan of Arc was married to Noah? <laughs> the survey revealed that. Wow. In today's Gospel text, Jesus encounters a woman from Samaria at Jacob's well. According to tradition and culture, these are two people from two distinct groupings of people who should never have any contact with each other. Did you catch what we read in the text this morning? What did they do? Did they say, hey, Jesus, that's your name? Cool. Um, how's the weather from your part? Well, not bad. You know, how's, how's things here? Well, you know, they're pretty hot. How was the game last night? Oh, the game was great. It was just amazing. Uh, Man U won, and uh, they just slaughtered Chelsea. Uh, did they have a conversation like that the way we do? What did they talk about? Stories. They told each other the stories. The Samaritan woman knew her narrative identity story very well. The story that separates Samaritans from Jewish people. And she reminded Jesus about this separation. Who are you, a Jewish man, that you should be talking to me? I'm a Samaritan woman. We don't mix together. We shouldn't be talking together. You shouldn't even be near me. Don't you remember the stories? Of course, he remembered. It's the stories of centuries of anger, and hurt, and animosity. The story of mistrust and mistreatment of two groups of people. Of course, Jesus knew that story. But he has a new story, a new narrative that he's trying to pass on. Instead of the old, old story of Jews versus Samaritans, Jesus offers the new story of the gift of God 
that is now being made available to people. But Jesus, Jesus doesn't just tell the story. He is the story of living water being offered by God to the world. Jesus invites this Samaritan woman to join him in this new story adventure. He's summoning the Samaritan woman to experience the living presence of God's spirit and truth as he embodied God in the flesh right there before her as they conversed at the well. From the fall of Israel in 8070 until the 14th of May 1948 when the state of Israel was created by a United Nations resolution. Until then, for nearly 2,000 years, there was no Jewish nation. There was no country in the world that had its official language as being Hebrew. And yet, for all those generations, nearly 2,000 years, as the exiled tribes of Israel became the diaspora all throughout the world, the world's resident aliens, the Hebrew language survived. How many of us had to study, or did choose to study, that's even worse, choose to study the dead language called Latin? Did you choose to study it? No. I need my head exam. But there's no such thing as the dead language of Hebrew. It survived. It even thrived. Jewish identity and culture never stopped being, even though there was no Jewish nation. With over 14 million Jewish peoples in the world, seven of those live in the United States, five million live in Asia, two million in Europe, and about 100,000 in Africa. Out of 7.2 billion people on planet Earth, the Jewish population comprises 0.2%. And yet, they have earned 22% of all the Nobel Prizes awarded for physics, chemistry, medicine, physiology, and literature. They have won 123 Nobel Prizes out of 502 since the Nobel Prize first came into being in 1901. 38% of the Nobel Prizes for economics, they've won. 67% of the John Clark Bates Medals for promis Promising eco Economists under the age of 40. How? How is it possible for people that didn't have a nation, that were foreigners and treated like aliens all over the world for a multitude of generations, well, the answer is, as one Jewish person said, education. What kind of education produces those sorts of results? Well, this person went on to say, we intentionally educate each generation in the narrative of our people, in the story of our people. Every new generation hears and learns and begins to live out because they continue to live as foreigners and aliens all over the world. They learn the history of their ancestors. Hebrew never became a dead language because it was continuing to tell their ongoing life story. The story of the ancestors, as this person said, was not something that happened to them in the past. It's something that still happens to us today. When Emperor Constantine made Christianity the official Roman religion of the Roman Empire, the story of the Christian Church began its long <coughs> history of being entwined with political powers and with nations. And it might have helped the Christian faith to spread throughout the whole world, but it also helped to mix up the story of Jesus with a lot of other stories. Yeah, the color's better on this one. The red is where there's significant growth of Christianity happening in our world today. The uh, orange, we'll call it orange, is where there's just growth happening in the world today of Christianity. The yellow, look at North America. 
is where there is decline in the Christian church. And the brown is where there is significant decline of the Christian church in the world. So this Lenten season, let's take time, let's make time to get our story, our faith story, straight. To discover again and again the history of Jesus of Nazareth and enter into his hyphen story. It's not just dead history. His story is also our story. And it's not as simple as memorizing Bible verses. Do you remember doing that? Sword drills and all that stuff? I remember gloating when I memorized my first 1,000 verses. And I could recite them. And I had to recite a number of them to a, a few elders in the church in, in another denomination. A thousand verses. And these were not just NIV or the message verses. These were King James verses. But it's not enough to just be able to recite and memorize Bible verses. We need to walk alongside Jesus. We need to rediscover how much of our story comes from His story. His life in us. We need to walk with Jesus through Samaria into Galilee to the cross and beyond that to the empty tomb. We need to walk with Jesus through our lives into those regions where people are despised. What are the Samarias today in our lives? We need to walk with Jesus around the block. On Friday night, we had the youth group. Speaking of walking around the block, we had the youth group at our house for March break. They wanted a sleepover. I said, no sleepover. Uh, let's just hang out, talk, play games, and, and watch a movie. And so they watched the movie. They ate. Oh, my goodness, but they eat. And, and then we, they said, let's go for a walk. And we took our dog with us. There, Ten of us went for a walk. And we we're going to walk through the cemetery. They're all excited to walk through the cemetery. We get to the gate that's right behind our house. We get to the gate to go into the cemetery and half of them balk and said, no, no, we can't do that. It's too scary. It, it's bad things happen here. Who knows what's going to happen? And I encouraged them gently and graciously and, and we all went in. I had given them all flashlights too. And we walked through the cemetery and they discovered, those that were scared, they discovered it really wasn't that frightening. There were no things jumping out of the ground at them. And as we walked for a while, I told them parts of our faith that assures us of hope and that talks to us about death and life. And they actually had fun walking with Jesus, talking a bit of the story of Jesus in a graveyard of all places. We need to walk with Jesus in our homes, around the block, into our workplaces, and yes, even into our governments and at every level that we possibly can in our society. You ever see those sporting events where somebody's holding up a sign and they used to in the, in the 80s have wear this rainbow afro as well and they'd hold up a sign that said John 3.16. You ever see those? Yep. This is a, a game from a Major League Baseball game a couple of years ago. It's everywhere. No matter how moving the words of that text are, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Great words, but there's so much more to the story, to the narrative of Jesus and of our faith than just that verse. It's powerful, but it's not the whole thing. And the world needs more than one or two or three or even a thousand verses given to them. If 21st century disciples are to keep the story of Jesus going and moving further into all the areas in that map where the Christian faith is shrinking in our world. We live in a post-Christian culture where the story of Jesus must intentionally be told, walked into the world in new and unfolding living story ways with our lives. I came across this quote and I, I love it. Practicing versitis. It's not an illness, but it's dropping verses. Dropping the occasional scriptural verse 
on people and expecting that that's going to change and, and make their life completely better and then leaving them alone. Shooting biblical bullets from our magazine of verses. There was an American author who wrote this. <laughs> won't automatically lead people on a walk with Jesus Christ. How true. Now, are there any bird watchers here? Ornithologists? The technical term. There's this one. Two. Well, there's two ways to study birds, right? You can go find roadkill, and then find a tray, and dissect it. Wow. You can dissect a dead bird and learn about it. Or you can go study a living bird in its natural habitat and study it over a season or over several seasons and learn everything you can about that type of bird and about birds. The first one, dead bird, studying that is like studying history for some people. Dead. The other one is living. It's an ongoing story that we can immerse ourselves in and learn from and continue to grow with. The ongoing story of our faith, of our walk with Jesus, reaches backwards and forwards in time. To live Jesus' story, we have to know the story of the Messiah, the Christ. And we can't know the story of the Messiah without knowing the story of a suffering Messiah. We can't know the story of Jesus if we don't know the story of Jesus who came to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. We can't know the story of Jesus unless we know the story of Isaiah, who tells us about the suffering Messiah. And we can't know the story of Isaiah if we don't know anything, anything else about the other prophets of God, who all call God's people back into faithful living out this story of God in their lives. And we can't know the prophet's story without knowing the story of Moses and the story of God delivering his people out of slavery in Egypt and into the promised land. And we can't know that. We can't know the God of the promises of Genesis if we don't know Genesis. And we can't know Genesis' promises without knowing God. The God who is our creator, redeemer, and sustainer. Who has made promises and who fulfills every one of them. God has always so loved the people of the world. No matter how and this never applies to you, I understand. No matter how cantankerous we ever get, or we might be, God so loved us. Period. That story never changes. His love never changes. Only the whole Bible gives us the whole story. The Jesus story is the 66th book called the Bible, plus something else. A mirror for every one of us to look in, to see Jesus and how we can reflect Him and live Him to the world all around us. The language of the church, very much so, is a good Gutenberg language. Printed words. Word, precepts, principles, laws, rules, regulations. We don't live in the Gutenberg world so much anymore. We live in a different G word. Anybody care to guess? You go online, you gotta, you're going to have to Google. Google. You're lost. How many people are geographically challenged? And you rely on Google Maps? We're a Google culture. A Google world. And the language of Google is image and story. What's the first thing a missionary does before they go to a new place in the world to serve and to work and to share Jesus? They learn the language of that area, the culture. It's about time that the church spends more and more time and energy on learning the language of this Google culture of image and story to share the story of Jesus through the story of our lives instead of just dropping verse bombs on people. This is already how our culture speaks today. 
How many of you like reality TV? It's kind of entertaining sometimes. The premise is really weird because, wow, reality is even far stranger than what they have on TV. <laughs> well, the TV series Secret Millionaire originated in England in 2006. It began to air in 2008 on Fox News, or Fox TV network in the States. And then uh, ABC picked it up until its final episode aired in 2013. Did you ever watch it? No. The Secret Millionaire. No. Every week, wealthy philanthropists went undercover in their worst neighborhoods. And for one week, these secret millionaires would rub shoulders with the everyday people there. They would work with them for minimum wage. They would not share the secret that they were really, 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 really wealthy people. And they would scout out in that week those individuals in that worst neighborhood who were doing great things without fanfare and without much money at all and making a difference in people's lives. And then at the end of the week, they would reveal themselves. And then they would give a $100,000 minimum gift to help whatever it was that that unsung, not noticed hero was doing in the neighborhood. It was a show designed to tell a great story, a humanist story of helping to make a difference in people's lives. The first episode in the States featured a woman named Danny Johnson who said no to the producers, four times flat no when they came and asked her. And finally she gave in and agreed to be one of the secret millionaires. But she said, I don't have a TV, my kids haven't had TV for 10 years, they don't know that sort of culture. So right away, the answer is no, 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 no. And finally, when the producers agreed to show her and her family at prayer together, worshiping God, and living out their faith, then she said, yes, we'll be part of the show. And one of the best stories from that series was called The Joy of Music, a group of anonymous, wealthy, everyday heroes that provided instruments free of charge to students who wanted to learn something about music. If they wanted a piano, a piano would appear on their doorstep. And then lessons would follow. If they wanted to learn how to play the flute, a flute would appear. If they wanted to learn how to play drums, heaven forbid, drums would appear. And lessons would follow. And the only requirement for these youth was that they kept their grades up that they stayed in school. And then the lessons and the instruments were completely free. And two young men on this episode had just graduated from high school. And because of the joy of music group, they got full ride scholarships to two different universities in the United States for music. Isn't that a story? We all love a good story. That's the basis of that series for years called The Chicken Soup for the Soul. There's all sorts of versions of The Chicken Soup for the Whole Soul series. We like those stories. But we have the greatest story of all. The greatest narrative to share with people about Jesus who offers us a spring of living water that will well up to eternal life in and through us to reach all the people. So let's stand up in a moment and raise our voices and sing. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. What's it called? Blessed Assurance. Blessed Assurance. How many times do we sing that? And how many times do we allow ourselves to live it in our daily lives? So that people look at us and they don't see us necessarily, but they see Jesus, the living water who quenches all thirst. And ask God how he wants us to live out his story in the week before us. To his praise and his glory.